Hello there. Welcome back to another episode of Star Wars in a Galaxy. Watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. I'm Eli. I'm Jacob. And today is that this episode is episode 98. 98 of Star Wars in a Galaxy. In today's episode, we're covering the first two episodes, technically, if you wanna if you don't want to count Great Heap, which is Great Heap is strange, but the first two episodes of the Mungle Bale of Arc of the of Star Wars droids. That would be Tale of the Rune Comets and the Rune Games. We're almost to the end of the series and we're dealing with R2D2 and C3PO helping along Mungo Baobab in his exploits against Admiral Screed of the Galactic Empire. It's it's getting intense. Let's get to our summaries, don't you think? Let's do it, absolutely. So in the tale of the Rune Comets R2D2, C3PO, and Mungo Baobab strike a deal to buy a map to the rune system, but they are chased by stormtroopers and they take shelter in the Baobab archives. Mungo reveals his plans to open a trade route to the rune system in order to do business with its its valuable its valuable rune stones, which are little crystals. However, meanwhile, Admiral Screed he gets word from Governor Kung of the rune system that he wants to do business with the Empire to sell the rune stones. So while following the the rainbow comets to the to the rune system because they're rainbow comets now, Mungo and the droids stumble upon the Umbo Light Space Station. Now, Kung, who runs, who's running the space station, thinks that they are uh, Imperial Emissaries, case of mistaken identity, and he tours them around the treasures of the station. However, Admiral Screed arrives there shortly thereafter. Mungo is exposed as an imposter. After a chase, the droids and Mungo are captured. R2-D2 manages to escape, and he's able to rescue them all. The ensuing fight detonates explosives, on the ship's engines, and the giant station is sent crashing into an asteroid with everyone abandoning ship. So our protagonists are safe for the moment, but so are Screed and Kung and the rest of the pirates, and, and Screed is uh, very upset with Kung. In the Rune games, Mungo, Baobab, C-3PO, and r 2 2 crash on the planet of Rune. They are they are found by two natives of the planet in the, Bo prom- the, the Umbu prom- province, whose names are are Orin Yom and her father Nils Yom, and they they help them out. And it's been revealed that Kung is the governor of a province of the of room called Tontum, but and he claims to have the entire planet, which he does, except for the Umbu province, who has been rebellious against his rule. And all uh, so and all of this is going to come to a head in what they call the Rune Games, which are a set of like games and races and and sports like things and so what and since seeing baobab as an enemy of the empire and also and with those in the umbu provinces governor kung allies with admiral screed to sabotage the to, to sabotage the umbu provinces team in the games and bring ultimate victory to and bring ultimate victory toward to the tom tomb promise and province and the empire in those said games he first sent a gigantic beast after them what is that beast called the shamunar the shamunar the shamunar after it's ancient them. hibernating beast very interesting it's, it's a dinosaur it's basically a dinosaur yeah he sends a dinosaur after them but that fails and they they manage to get there then he tries to poison the 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 mumble juice that they're trying to drink and that works on one person, but then all that also that fails. And C-3PO is actually forced to to complete the first lap of a relay race, which he does dreadfully in, but it's fine because Mungo and Oren pick up the, the flak for him, and they end up winning the race, foiling the plans of of Governor Kung and Admiral Screed, and then Mungo and Oren set off to find the runestones. Yes. All right. So, Hail of the Rune Comets. This was an interesting episode. Absolutely, yeah. What are, your, what are your initial thoughts? I was a little... I'm kind of mixed on these on these episodes, personally. So, apparently, I think this entire arc is written by Ben Burt, actually. Um, yeah, it, it was. It was, yeah. Which which I think is really interesting, because, because you know, Ben Burt, and I'm not trying to, to diss him at all, but he, is, he was... He was a sound guy. He, but, and it's interesting that he decided to get into writing with this stuff. Yeah. So, and so he wrote, I'm trying to like, let's see. Yeah. He wrote the, this entire arc, I think he did. Yeah. I, th- I think so. I believe so. Based on the credits. Great. That's cool. And what was I going to say? So yeah, he does, he writes this entire arc and I, I think that's very, 
I think that's very interesting, and I think he has a certain style that does, I will say, feel a bit more Star Wars e than some of the other stuff in droids. Though I will, I, I'm not going to say like, oh, some droids episodes aren't Star Wars; they're all Star Wars. But I feel like Bert, from by virtue of working on the original films so closely in hand, does have that touch, and he knows what he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the idea of, you know, the map to the rune system, you know, it made me think of, obviously, you know, the map to Skywalker. We know you have it. So, oh, like, yeah, absolutely. It's cool to see. And, and see you know, like, like, felt like when... Sorry, go ahead. And I really actually also like how much, I really love how much the Empire's presence is, is felt in this arc. Like, don't get me wrong, the From Gang and the evil Viziers and the Pirates of Kaibo Ren have been interesting villains. But the Empire carries with them that gravitas that those pirate gangs just don't. Yeah, it's interesting that it's kind of cool because for so much of the show, you, you know, we're really focused on and it's a very it's a very lawless feel. There's a lot of freedom. You know, the Empire doesn't really figure it's just, you know, pirates being pirates, people doing business, yada yada yada. And then all of a sudden, boom, here comes here comes the Empire. You've got You've got Screed, you've got the you've got the stormtroopers. It's it's yeah. a big it's a big change. Yeah, and I feel like it 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 does well for the series if you know like it, it it's weird. I feel like Screed is is an interesting villain, and I think that he he seems very Lucas, like the whole like he has a half robotic face and he's very mustache twirly. Like that 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 just seems like something that. I'm not saying Lucas created Screed, but it seems like it was like at least created in in a way that he would have created it. Yeah, Screed Screed's an interesting Screed's an interesting villain. He almost seems slightly not all the way human, like maybe near human. Yeah, looking at his design, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. And obviously, he's part robot. I don't know. He's cool. He's cool. I like Screed. Yeah, he's 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 very interesting, and I and I and I think it's like interesting, especially because like you know. Star Wars has always had an interesting thing with robotic villains. Like, obviously, the main villain of the original trilogy is mostly a robot in Darth Vader. And there's, like, you know, there's that line that, that Obi-Wan says to Luke that summarizes, I think, a lot of George's feelings in the matter. In Jedi, he's more machine now than man, twisted and evil. And I, and I think George has always had a fascination with that idea of what if the machines we program, like, decide they they might want to program us this time and you know that's where that's where ideas like the droid army and general grievous come in that's where things like the bounty hunter droid ig88 come in you know like people being like at least or at least partial partial at least partially machines or like cyborg related is not is is a is a star wars trope that has been in this universe since 1977 and we're still seeing today yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, it is. Yeah, it's one of those ideas that Star Wars really loves to really loves to play with. You know, kind of the definitions, the the boundaries. You know, the views, how we treat. You know, droid or robot yeah. versus living being sentience, and then you know how. And what's things, the difference? And and what's the difference? How do those concepts? That? Yeah, how do they overlap? Like, is it even like I think in droids they kind of they kind of toe the line of saying like, is it even really a relevant difference with just the way that R2. And then we have things like, and, and like this could com completely continues yeah, into, into the modern era where we have things like, like where we have things like Clone X in the most, in one of the most recent episodes of the Bad Batch, who seems like a programmed clone trooper. How much was he programmed? What does he like? We don't, we don't, we don't know everything that we need to know about Clone X, but it, it, you know, he doesn't seem fully as human as the other clones that was interesting so it, it's it's something that star wars is picking up again and again and again and again and like and, and or like stuff like or stuff like in andor when b2 emo says he needs more power to lie for cassian oh yeah that's yeah strange. oh that's uh, that's a great example absolutely that's strange like yeah, like that's absolutely. a moral decision and yet it's actually built technically built into these droids that's interesting how human are these things? Are they human? Or are they not human? At a certain point, what's the difference? Yeah, like the yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I, I, I love the way they kind of play and blur those, 
blur those boundaries. So what do you think about what they call that area? They say, oh, you need to travel through the cloak of the Sith to get to the rune. So that's yeah. The do they say the word Sith? The cloak of the in Sith. In the original yeah. trilogy? They don't say the word Sith in the original trilogy. This is, as far mm-hmm. as I know, the first on-screen utterance of the word Sith in Star Wars, period. Fascinating. It is really fascinating. It is, it is, I it, I find it really fascinating. I, and, I, and I think there's a lot there. And I think that, like, I think there's this idea that the, like, I don't think they knew what the Sith exactly were. I mean, you know, in the original Thrawn trilogy, the species that Thrawn was, was allying with were eventually called the Nogri. That's where Rook comes from. And other yeah. people from that species, like Karabark. I feel like that's his name. Karabark, I feel like. I'm not. I'm not sure who you're referring to. Kabarok. Kabarok. He he's he's like he's the he's the Nogri who helps who helps the rebels in the Thrawn trilogy. Kabarok. Anyway, the point the point is the Nogri were originally going to be called the Sith. The species was really going to be called really? the Sith, and and basically they were going to be a species that was in that was that was. That was like subservient to Darth Vader, and that's why Darth Vader was mm-hmm. called the Dark Lord of the Sith. Wow. So oh. when did when did the idea of the, the Sith species when did that come into play? Do you know? That's the, very, I didn't know that because that's what very do you mean the Sith species? The the Sith species, you know, from Legends, you know. Yeah, the Sith species Sith, was a, was a lot later on. I think it that was in the mid two thousands after the prequel trilogy. I think the idea that like like I think the Sith was an order. But I think it originally, like, I think what originally happened was it was was dark side users in in like the early, early, early days of legend. And I don't mean like in our real world. I mean in like like out thousands, 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 thousands of years before the movies. Basically, dark side force users came upon the Sith species who had an affinity for the dark side of the force, and they like breeded, and they basically like they 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 combine their communities and they breed within each other so and and so like the sith order and the sith species became one and the same but then they were wiped out oh. and then like stuff happened so the sith became you know it's it like it's it's like it's like what we were what we've been seeing with the idea of, of a mandalorian in the star wars like the sith is not a code then the sith is not an, it's, it's not a people it's a creed you don't oh, have to be yeah, that, born that was, into yeah. being a Sith to be a Sith, obviously, but 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 Sith is just a group of an order of people who believe the same things. In this case, the usage of the dark side for of the, of the force for galactic domination. But but I I think this this Sith this Sith in this like I think it was like sort of like a demonic usage of it. Like I don't think they mm. knew what Sith meant yet, but like Sith was always a word thrown around with Star Wars, even if it was never said in any of the movies. Like I, I think, like, yeah, well, like I think a lot decided of, what it meant. Yeah. So I, I think they're like, well, we need to make this sound really bad, Sith. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, bad, mysterious. I, I, whatever it may be. Yeah. No, I, I, I perked up when I heard it. I'm like, whoa, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's it's interesting. The what else was I gonna say? Oh yeah, I found it really interesting actually. The whole like the whole sequence where where th- where Mungo and C three PO and R two D two are are trying to follow the comets giving it this episode tale of the room comics its namesake i don't know about yeah. you but like the, that comet sequence reminded me a lot of the comets that knocked freaking r2 and the rest of d squad out of hyperspace oh in the D squad. yeah it reminded me yeah it reminded me of that too i couldn't put my finger on it but you're right it, it did was very d squad is very reminiscent of this i wonder if they got any yeah maybe they got any inspiration from it maybe they don't maybe they didn't i don't know yeah. But before we go too much further, look in that first cantina scene. I just want to say R two D two, moonwalking and breakdancing is absolutely hilarious. Yeah, like, I, I, I was know. like, wait, what? What is happening? What oh, is yeah. happening right no, now? No, absolutely. They, they, I loved it. Rubio and R two have done have done the most batshit crazy things in the show, and we've just I feel like this this entire season of, is an arc of us just learning to accept that. C C three PO literally like taunts like this, like puts his hands on his head. That he literally goes like na na boo boo. Yeah, like, what's like, it called? The shamanar. Like, the shamanar. He literally does yeah, that. Yeah, the like, the shamanar. I'm like, all right, whatever, you know, <laughs> you're my man. Like, like, don't question. Like it. I said, this, yeah. 
like, like I said previously, the show has a lot of moments. It has its moments. Yeah, but but yeah, they get drawn aboard this ship, and I all I I really do love the idea that like, and and th- and this is another another fun thing that I love, and and you know, say what you will about the campiness of this idea, but like I love that that Kung and his me- his men are so gullible. I love that they like that 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 Mungo and R two and three PO kid fall on into their ship, and they're like, oh yeah, that's the Empire. Yeah, well, I think that that for uh, for Kung, his greed kind of blinds him because is one of his underlings with the the insectoid guy who I Gaff. who I absolutely love. Gaff. Yeah, Gaff He's is like, my glut shit from this arc. Gaff is my glut shit. I fucking love that guy. Gaff, yeah. Gaff is great. He's like, are are you sure? Are you are you sure these are the they? I didn't expect the Empire to look like this. And then, then of all things, what is what does the captain say? He, he says like, Josh, you'll offend them, like. Don't mess this up for me. Don't fumble my bag right now. Yeah, no, Gaff. I looked up his species because I was, I was, because I was, I was interested in, in what was going on with that. Gaff is a Kobok. I wonder if I, I want to look at this. Was Gaff? Was it, what were Koboks ever anywhere else in Legends? The answer is yes. Where were they? Wait, give me a second. Wait, I, I see a cannon tab. Or Kobox cannon. My fucking god. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Kobox or cannon. No way. Where? Yeah. How? Apparently, James Lucino included Kobox in Catalyst. The mm. Rogue One prequel. Of all places. Absolute legend. So, hey, hey Disney. I'm, I'm looking at you right now. Skeleton crew. If we don't see a Kobok, I'm suing. If we don't see one of the one of Gap's people, I'm suing. Obviously, that's a joke for legal reasons. Yeah, but we need to see a Kobok and like a, an on-screen live-action co Kobok. And I feel like that's something like, I feel like that's something that I feel like that's some but something that like one of the, like the people really steeped in canon, like like Pablo Hidalgo or Leland Chi, might propose to like John Favreau, and John Favreau like th- it would be like this is the stupidest idea in the world. And we're doing it. Yeah, definitely. I could, I could, I could see that potentially. You know. Yeah. Also, R two D two or C three PO. He says the line. He says, "I have a bad feeling about this." Twice. As they're flying towards the space station. Twice. Wait, where's the second time? At the end of the episode. Oh right, right, right. Still have a bad he feeling. Finally, finally said the line. Yeah. Finally did it. I mean, actually, I think there was. I, I think it was in a, a previous episode. I think it was in a previous episode. I think in like really? four or five. Oh, yeah. oh man, I must have missed it. I forgot to talk about it. Forgot to. Uh, I, I, I'm it sure in. I referenced it. Yeah, three PO has a bad feeling about this in 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 a two. Oh. Uh, in the second. Dang. Yeah, but it's it. it's been, it's been, it was the first time in a while, so. I think that was the only other time, honestly. Yeah, I I also love the the line after C three PO has a bad feeling about it. Did you catch that? I I caught it. I'm forgetting exactly what was said. You have a bad feeling about everything, three PO. Yeah, which is some fantastic meta commentary that I fucking love. It, it's moments like that where the characters almost know they're in Star Wars that that just make me laugh sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, moments like that are just too good. Yeah, and and, and it's a little, yeah, little self stars when stars gets a little bit self conscious. Yeah, it's interesting. Itself. The relationships that the, that's actually an interesting idea that I was talking with some some of my, some friends last night about, like the idea that like when characters like what are Star Wars character what what are Star Wars characters relationships with the story and with the universe that they're living in, like yeah. This is a bit of a tangent, but whatever. This, this, that's what the show is for. You know, like stuff like we've been seeing with Din. We've been seeing with Din in the Mandalorian. We're recording this, by the way, a while before we're releasing this. This we're recording it after the release of Chapter Seventeen, the Apostate of the Mandalorian, just to give you mm-hmm. to to what we've seen and what we haven't. But and, and this doesn't really have to do with the Apostate, but but I'm I'm just saying because maybe something will happen in the next few episodes that might change this. I don't know. Like Din's lack of understanding of the Star Wars universe is fucking hilarious. 
How so? It, it, ju it just presents such an interesting view of the universe because, you know, Tim still hasn't really realized that he's in a Star Wars story yet. Like, you know, like when he's yeah, yeah. on Tython with Grogu, does this look Jedi to you, kid? Yeah. <laughs> the seeing stone. Are you seeing anything, kid? Fair point, fair point, good point. And, and like Luke freaking yeah. Skywalker walks up to him after destroying him the Dark Troopers and he goes, are you a Jedi? Like, I don't know, man. He's carrying a lightsaber. You think he's a Jedi? It's a possibility. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just I just find it funny to, to see what, because I feel like C-3PO and R2, especially R2, are, a, are very aware that they're in this universe. Yeah, absolutely. It's they they get very very. It's very it gets very very self referential. Yeah, because I'm self conscious maybe. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and like, is like what haven't they experienced at the end? Of the day? Yeah, and, and and like and, 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 and you know like 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 even like and that's what I love about love about that. I'm thinking about like the line of C three PO's and R two D 2s relationship is just so fantastic. Like there's that line of course there's the infamous line of New Hope. Go that way. You'll be my functioning in within days, you know, I did scrap pile. You know, like yeah. they've done this stuff before. Like, you know, we don't know how like well like this is the this is the tenth episode and eleventh episode of the show, but we don't know what number of adventure this is that they've gone on. If we place it in Legends, if we place it in Can, doesn't matter. They've gone on dozens, if not hundreds of them. So like Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. I just thought that Star Wars characters knowing when and when not there in Star Wars is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. What do you, do you have anything for the rest of this episode? Because I don't I, know the whole back, back end of this episode. You know, we have the, the chase around and this yeah this big fight, and they get captured, and then they're they're free again, and there's these little fluffy creatures are involved. And I, I don't yeah. I know. I, I didn't really. I couldn't really make heads or tails of it in terms of, in terms of what to glean from it. What did you think about it? I, well, I think that, well, well first of all, I, I do want to say that I say, the, well, I have a, a couple things. First of all, we get the backstory. We get some backstory about Mungo Baobab, which is his father has a merchant fleet that apparently isn't doing so well. Yeah, and he wants to do this to restore, to like, keep, restore keep, the, his, keep, like, the, keep the Baobab fleet out of bankruptcy. Yeah, which is interesting, and and you know we were talking about this last episode, but for all, but this is an interesting stance for Star Wars to take because this is that is a pro corporatism stance. The hero is 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 involved in like a business and corporation, which is very. I don't know. Important. I think there's a difference between there's a difference between being in a business and and being part of some massive. We don't really know what the deal with the bail is. It is it's definitely kind of jarring though, because usually, the very very infrequently do people who are the real real protagonists of something being like yeah i'm doing this to make money well, at least in star wars like we, we have people like grief cargo who like yeah i mean and like i'm not saying kind of... making money is inherently bad or anything and, or I'm, and I'm not saying that star wars is saying that but this guy has a fleet this guy has yeah. enough co corporate influence that he has a fucking fleet i mean that's that's literally the plot of that's literally how the bad guys start happening in the phantom menace is yeah, it is interesting that they're corporate people have so much money and power that they have a fleet, which, which I thought was interesting. But, but whatever, it's also kind of subtly not really revealed that I think that did you catch this like when where where Kung says they've been pulling in trade ships with their tractor beam? Oh yeah, I mean isn't the isn't the whole the whole deal with the the space station that they just they just like capture and. and and pirate like any passing ship and that's how they've amassed so, all their their fortunes so maybe i'm stretching a little bit with this implication but i feel like that's implying that kung is the reason for the failure of daddy baobab's fleet even though mungo doesn't know that and you know that's not said in front of him that's possible i didn't i didn't really get that from this to be honest but then um, it's, it's yeah. possible no absolutely I, i'm i'm i could totally be a stretch but but i but i feel like it's a weird thing to include that line in there if it doesn't mean that Kung is the v villain of the series in another way because he he 
because and because he is the reason why Daddy Baobab. I'm gonna keep calling him Daddy Baobab. I uh, don't know. Does Mungo Baobab's father have a name? Because I don't want to call him that. No, he's just Baobab. Let's see. Oh my fucking god. I, I'm 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 looking at Baobab's Wikipedia page, and Baobab once met Lando Calrissian. Oh wow! Yeah, he has a pretty extensive story, actually. Mungo or Mungo's dad? Mungo. Mm. Anyway, we don't know. Anyway, so 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 Daddy Baobab. Back to my point. I said, but 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 so I, I just find it interesting that the idea could be that 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 Daddy Baobab is in all this trouble because of because of Kung, and Mungo just doesn't know that, and I don't think probably Kung knows that. Because it's not like he has a specific vendetta against Baobab. He's just pulling in any trade ship that comes near them. Yeah. So I, I thought that's interesting. What I also liked is I like the reappearance of Nergon 14. Where did where, where did it first appear? In the, the From Gang arc. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Remember, right, it's, right. it's yeah, the explosive that. element that blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, it's on Tynes Horky. It's in the Lost Prince. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, but it, it, it reappears in, in Tales of the Rune comics, and I, I thought that was a really nice touch because I, I, I really like when, like, stuff is, like... I, I, I like when that stuff is reappears. It makes the universe feel stronger, like this is an actual dangerous element and not just something that appeared that one time. Oh yeah, definitely. I found out also that Nergon fourteen is also canon. Um, really, Nergon fourteen has appeared in Sabine, My Rebel Sketchbook, and Ray's Survival oh. Guide to in universe reference books from very early in canon. So we have Daniel Wallace and Jason Fry respectively to thank for Nergon fourteen being canon. So hey, spe- speaking of canon and reference books, yeah, I also realized that the Baobab Merchant Fleet, especially in the Rune games, they keep referring to the Baobab Merchant Fleet. And I was like, why is that so familiar? Why is that so familiar? It turns out Ben Burt in 2001 published this book with Star Wars called The Galactic Phrasebook and Travel Guide, which I read. It's a, it's a, it's, it's very silly, very non-canon, but it's a great read. I recommend it. It's a lighthearted romp, but it's really good. And the, the Baobab Merchant Fleet figures quite heavily in that. So another, Another example of that as well, I guess. Yeah, it. it I, I love how this stuff is keep that this stuff keeps come showing up in in canon. I I think that's that's really funny. Yeah. Let's see one more thing. I think I had one more thing. I also just like the. I I also just like the. You know, we get to see a bunch of things that R two does in droids that he will later do in other Star Wars stuff. Like for example, like he does the smoke screen trick to get himself out of out of a jam in, in this episode. Yeah, he definitely and, sure does. And in, this is, this is, I think, when was this episode? Let's see. The Rune Games was, oh yeah. So this episode was 1985. So it would be literally 20 years, two decades until Revenge of the Sith came out and R2 did the smokescreen trick again. Which yeah, I, I, thought I thought that the, um, the little transparent fields, speaking of Revenge of the Sith, the little transparent fields that they were kind of using to, the trap fields to keep the to keep the prisoners in, that, that really reminded me of Revenge of the Sith as well, you know. How, is, how did this happen? We're smarter than us in those those Apparently versions. not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I thought maybe there might have been some that might have been a proto proto version of that, the idea of those kind of personal ray shields as well. Yeah. Just absolutely. a possibility. Another thing I was gonna say about this, but this arc in general, and, and this is something I'm I'm really interested in. I love the presence that Palpatine has in this this arc. And it's it's interesting, yeah, the way that the, the stormtroopers. And, and and you might be saying to me, and I'm not saying talking about you, I'm saying like people who've watched this, you're like, wait, doesn't the Emperor not appear in this arc? And I would say to you, exactly. He's just mentioned over and over and over and over again. Screed seems to have a personal relationship with Palpatine. This is not just some low-ranking admiral. This is not some yeah. guy they assigned a few Star Destroyers and a system and said, go. This guy se- seems to be pretty high up in the Empire. and. The, his exploits seem to be exploits that are important, not just to him, of course, but to the Emperor. And not, and I meant, like, not just to the Empire, but the Emperor himself. And I made that joke, yeah. like, a few episodes, like, the, the episode when we saw freaking when we saw Screed first, I'm like, oh, I wonder if he's talked with Thrawn at all. But based on what we know about Screed, he probably has. 
because it seems like he's a very important figure in the empire. Yeah, absolutely. But it's interesting how even the stormtroopers are mentioning the emperor a lot. The emperor wants this. The emperor will not be pleased. That seemed very, very different from later portrayals. Yeah, it, it's interesting. With the empire. Because, yeah, like, and, 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 and it, it probably just is this these room stones, which are of immense value and can bring great wealth to the empire. But the empire has a real interest in rune, like, more yeah. than most planets. Maybe there was like a Jedi temple on Rune, and maybe if you did the right things, you could access a place between time and space, a world between worlds, you could say. Oh, uh, between worlds. As soon as I said the, the phrase, the Empire, the Emperor has a particular interest on Rune, I thought, the, emp the Emperor has a particular interest on Luthal, the threat that hung over the entire Rebel ser series. And we only found out what what that actually meant in like the third to last episode. Baloney, you son of a gun. Keep up waiting four seasons to learn why the Empire cares about this backwater planet and the outer rim. Yeah. Well, you know, the bigger, the longer the wait, the sweeter the reveal. Absolutely. Some would yeah. say. Yeah. So, how do we feel? We want to move on to the Rune Games. Yeah, I think so. The Rune Games is a, is a is an episode that I I, I kind of struggled with because I felt like it was very much a copy of A Race to the Finish, but also not as good. Yeah, I was kind of like, oh no, we need to win this race in order to defeat this person because the race gives us the ability to claim the planet and we save the planet and yay! And it I yeah, know, it felt a little contrived to me and and and, and it, it's i might, it's I might say it, it's it's a weird thing because you know like even with like the racing stuff involved in there like i'd say the 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 frequency of racing appearing in droids is actually way higher than the frequency of racing appearing in star wars otherwise like racing in star wars yeah. absolutely does appear otherwise absolutely the pod race in phantom menace faster than the recent episode of the bad batch you know, there's other various examples, but we've already gotten two racing episodes in the show, which is interesting. But I, I actually, I think my favorite part of this episode is I really like the character of Oren Yom. I think Oren Yom is a really interesting mm. character. And I, and I think she and Nils, I'm hoping they'll appear more in this arc. Because I think there's some really, you know, I, I like seeing people like Oren Yom. I like seeing people like Kia from the first arc. I like seeing people like Jessica Mead. Oh yeah, Kia. From the second arc, people who are who are genuinely good people and who are trying to 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 fight back against imperial tyranny. Yeah, because and and not like Arin... and, and not just say they're doing that and then go become a space fascist, Jan. Yeah, Did I say that out poor, loud. Poor Jan, you didn't know what he was doing. Did, did I say that out loud? Yeah, we have we have, yeah, Orin and 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 Niels are are very cool characters, you know. They're from the province of, uh, was it Umbu? Umbu, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, there's so many goofy, kind of silly sounding, I think it's all of Star Wars is filled with silly sounding place names, but especially this, especially these, these, excuse me, these couple of place names. Incredibly, yeah. incredibly silly. Absolutely. A little um, hard to keep track of, but there, Umbu is this rebellious province. Yeah. It's very interesting. They have to, and and it it's a little convoluted, I think. You know, you have to. They, what Kung has an entrance in this race, but so does Pontum. Pontum and yeah, and some other ones too. Bail Mongo has to Mongo has to race in well, the race. It's, well, he's he's know, allying with Umbu, and they've lost a lot of their racers. Is the idea, and um, oh okay, and be, because remember the that droid poisoned the the water or the juice or whatever it is yeah yeah the, the beverage yeah but what was i gonna say about that i was gonna say it's interesting like different provinces or like i guess you could call them districts appearing uh, like like competing in a game that is literally like life or death for a bunch of them does that remind you of anything 
obviously this was before that. Like the Hunger Games. But the, the this Hunger gives Games me major Hunger Games season. vibes. Yeah, I only watched the first Hunger Games movie. I never never read the books. It was never quite my thing, so I didn't really get that from this. But that is an interesting interesting comparison. I'm, I'm not a um, Hunger Games fan myself, but I, I just, like that that just automatically stick, stuck to me. Dystopian future, divided up by provinces, ruling provinces, you know, all that kind of stuff, class struggles and stuff like that that I know vaguely of with reference to the Hunger Games. You know, obviously, the Hunger Games was way, way, way after this. I think it was the late 2000s, I think it was. And this was, of course, the mid '80s, but I thought that was interesting. You want to talk about the the, the Shamunar? Oh goodness, yes, the Shamunar, this giant, the giant dinosaur that awakens. It's a dinosaur. Almost kills everybody. So, let me ask you something, okay? What was I gonna say? Right, that's what that's what I was gonna say. There, are, there are a lot of different, really strange species in this, like or strange animals, strange beasts in this show, and some of them hit for me, and some of them miss for me. And I think I think the same can be said for you. I don't want to speak for you, obviously, but I feel like you've also expressed like some of them work and some of them don't. Does the Shamanar work for you? I don't know. This entire episode doesn't really work for me, to be honest. The Shamanar included. I think it just felt a little bit kind of meandering, contrived. You know, we had these big long scenes of 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 Kung and and uh, Scree just kind of hanging out and talking about kind of the, just the same things over and over again, and then we had obviously the Shamanar, which I don't, it didn't work for me. I, to yeah, that that, that is that's totally fair. I'm still trying to figure out whether it worked for me, but yeah, no, it was a, it was a crazy sequence, and I thought he was a serpent at first until I saw his legs. I don't know if the same thing happened to you, but. But but yeah, this this entire episode it just just and 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 please tell me if if you dis you disagree with me. But like for me, it feels like a race to the finish, except for without Boba Fett. Yeah, I, I kind of it was you know, the sabotage and everything. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree yeah, with that. What was I gonna say? I will say that that you know who the MVP of this episode was, other than Oren. I think Oren was one one of the MVPs of this episode. But the other MVP is obviously Gaff. Love that guy. Mm, yeah I love the... how about the mud how about the mud men the mud people those are pretty those are pretty funny they're just weird that was weird blob like creatures that just randomly accost and attack r2d2 and c3po i don't really know either in the episode and then we have this droid that takes r2d2 like catches a mud person puts him inside of like a little bottle and it's like carrying it around and then this other droid, reason, like, yeah. takes it from r2 it's pretty strange it's it, very strange. This, this episode raises a lot of questions for me. I will say that C-3PO saying we're not in any danger with Gaff's shadow lurking in the background is fantastic. Like, oh, it's yeah, so absolutely. campy, but it so works. Let's see. Well, what else? Yeah, Screed says a line that's fantastic that I love. But before the game start, the Emperor would enjoy these games, provided he always won, which is maybe the most Palpatine thing I've heard in in the history of my life. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see, what else? I've been seeing, there's this character who I didn't catch in the episode. as a character named Bundingo. Well, I don't exactly know who that is. Let's see, Bundingo. Who is Bundingo? Oh, Bundingo is the, 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 the assassin droid that fucks everything oh. up. Yeah, he's the one who takes R2-D2's mud person. It's like, mine, and takes it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just, that's right. It's weird. Yeah, that's that. That, that is weird. And and it ha- and, a, and a droid having a name like Bundingo is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Also, remember the thing with the gravity. That was the other thing that Bundingo was doing at the end of this episode was with the gravity, where he was turning it when where he turned it off so that people and and he was destroyed by it. Actually, I remember remember he he there was that big crater. Yeah, yeah. All that, that was that was weird. Yeah, because if you fell off your horse basically during the race, you get sucked down this tube, and the guy is supposed to, I guess, lower the gravity to prevent the person from dying, being squashed by their fall, but then the droid turns the gravity up, but then eventually he falls down the tube and makes a droid-shaped hole in the ground. It's it's very it's very cartoony, but it, 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 this it, is it, a cartoon. Yeah, yeah I, I can't say this episode worked for me, but, you know, hits and misses, you know. Anything else? 
anything else or do you want to just wrap it up here that's all i got for this episode that's all i got for these episodes i don't know so i i think yeah. in the meantime that i, I think that's going to be it for this episode of star wars and galaxy next week is going to be our final episode covering droids we're going to finish the mungo bay above arc across the rune sea and the frozen citadel and as much as i've i've i've, I've enjoyed droids i'm glad we're getting to an end with it I, yeah, I think it, it, I think I think we've run our course with it. It has its moments, but it's best in small doses. This show, yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. But yeah, in the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter at Any Galaxy Pod, Instagram at Star Wars in a Galaxy. You can listen to us on Spotify, Instagram, Google Podcast. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast. We will be there. Follow us on. Yeah, you can subscribe subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you all jo- enjoyed the bracket stream with Brandon and Maggie and Sean, assuming that actually did happen, which I think it did. We're recording this before that, but and also we're going to announce this now. Tune in, please tune in, on April 2nd. On April 2nd, we are going to be, we are going to be streaming. We're going to be live streaming with our good friends Meg and Devor uh, Mondam, and as, as well as Jared Bachman Stubbs and Connor Chikiti. We are going to be streaming with them to celebrate three years of In a Galaxy, as well as 100 episodes. We're very excited to do that. We're going to be having some fun. We'd love to see everybody in the chat. We're just going to be hanging out, having a good time, and that'll be our episode for that week. We're very excited about that. And stay tuned for March Epic Confrontations. We got two matches. I think you'll love both of them. But in the meantime, I think all there's left to say is may the Force be with you. Always. Always.